Okay, so uh, first and foremost, I want to say thank you to the entire HackFest team for letting me come up here and speak. Um, it's always a little difficult not really knowing any French, so I'm excited to be here. Um, and congratulations again on 10 years. It's, it's fantastic. So what I wanted to come up and speak about today was you want to be a consultant, okay? Quick show of hands, who here is a consultant right now? Okay, anybody new to the field that is aspiring to be? Okay, a few of you, good, we're, we're gonna learn some things today. <laughs> some harsh realities. <laughs> so, uh, obligatory, who am I slide? Uh, my name is Justin Ryder, I'm the Vice President for the Security Operations Center and Incident Response for a company that I promised I wouldn't say their name for, but if you're the least bit savvy with LinkedIn, you know my name, you can probably figure it out now. They didn't think that far. Uh, former red team and uh, incident response for a company called CBI based out of Detroit, Michigan. Um, I also did consulting for a few different companies as a 1099 employee. Uh, my record with Marriott Hotels was 307 nights in one year. Uh, if you do that, they send you this nice little letter that says thank you for spending all this money with us. Uh, please do it again next year. Um, and if you're really lucky, you'll get like some little card from somebody's daughter that says thank you for keeping daddy employed or whatever. Um, I also do a lot of lockpick villages. Um, specifically, I've done three out of the last five lockpick villages here. So if I look familiar to some of you, I see some you know light bulbs turning on like, oh, that's right, but he had hair back then. Yeah, um, so I always look forward to it. It's a great time. Um, Cameron is the guy who's running it this year. Absolutely go down and talk to him. Great guy, great at teaching. Um, so try to pop down that way when you have time. Um, and then lastly, if you wanna follow me on Twitter, you know, shameless personal plug, uh, that's my uh, Twitter handle there. Hop on, let's talk if you need any help. Um, if you're trying to get into the field and you want uh, advice on a resume or anything like that, feel free to talk to me. Send me a DM, follow me, and uh, let's talk about it. I'm always uh, trying to pay it forward. There were a lot of people that helped me get to where I am, and it's only right that I do the same. So getting started in consulting, um, there's a couple different paths, but they're not really mutually exclusive. Um, one side is education, and education is obviously very important. Um, if you're just coming into this, you may not really know a lot. For me personally, uh, my background was, I was an industrial welder before I got into information security. Yeah, those, uh, one of these things is not like the other. Um, but I was also the only guy who could fix a printer jam in the entire company and uh, set up uh, certain uh, fiber switches from the company that we uh, acquired over time. So we had, uh, we had these Cisco switches with a fiber backbone and nobody knew how to set them up. So what happens, you know, the industrial welder has to take his mask off and his gauntlets and, you know, go set up the switch. Um, college is very important. It's going to teach you a few things. I don't want to say it's the only thing, um, especially in the United States right now. I apologize for everything, you know. <laughs> not my fault, but we look kind of dumb. Um, it's not the only route to take. Uh, but you will learn a lot of the basics in there, you know, things like the OSI model, which, you know, we still occasionally use, um, subnetting, which we use a lot. Um, certifications are also another very important thing, because if you look at any job posting, what's listed there? A degree and probably 10 random certifications that don't go together because you know Bill and Mary from HR read this thing that was a link from a Pinterest post somewhere and this is what your cybersecurity people need to have. Um, but it's always good to have some of those. They, they do teach uh, certain things. Myself, I just finished the SANS Forensics 500, Windows Forensics, awesome class, you know, shameless plug for them as well. Um, and then of course SANS itself, they teach a lot of amazing courses, uh, as well as having a graduate's program now. Uh, if you have the funding and mental fortitude to go through that, it's a great program. The other side is networking. 
and this is really more for me personally what I leveraged. Networking is amazing because it gives you a way to circumvent that HR screen. Because let's face it, when you look at the postings for certain jobs, uh, specifically with consulting, they're gonna want a ton of certifications. None of them make sense, and you might have three out of the 10. They're just, it, it's the most random stuff in the world. And for somebody like myself, who again, was a welder, um, I got myself on LinkedIn, which, you know, let's face it, LinkedIn is like professional Facebook. And then there's Twitter. Twitter was great because it gave me an opportunity to follow people that I met at a conference that I went to on a whim. And here was this one person and I started a conversation with them and then I was able to watch the conversations that they were having with other people and introduce myself to them. And before you know it, your, your area of your network starts to grow immensely. The other thing is professional events. Uh, certain prof professional events like Network After Work is a huge one, uh, at least down in the States. They're in every major city. There's a couple of them a month, and it's an opportunity just to get together in an open venue like this, have some drinks, talk to some people, get your name out there, exchange some business cards, and start to meet other people in the field that's gonna open up some doors for you. Conferences, why are we here? We're here to learn things, we're here to talk to people, right? Um, that was really how I got my start, it was B-Sides Detroit. The first year, it was held in a vegetable processing plant. Yeah, yeah, we were top notch. And uh, I was scared to death, I was, you know, again, a welder who grew up in the sticks out in Michigan, West Michigan, um, never seen a parking meter in my entire life and I was in downtown Detroit, pretty certain I was gonna get shot, but I figured it was a risk I was willing to take. Um, got a ticket, because again, never saw a parking meter, didn't know what it was there for. Um, <laughs> it was qu quite an experience. Um, but I met a lot of those people there that kinda helped kick my uh, career off. So, as you go through and do that, you start to meet people, you're gonna get some interviews set up. Um, in my case, the people that I met at the conferences and on Twitter were actually the people who were setting up a lot of these interviews for me. That's how you know you're networking with the right people because they want to see you succeed because if you succeed and you go work for them, guess what? You're going to help build their success as well. Um, but if you fail to plan, you should probably plan to fail. If you know nothing about the company that you're interviewing for, it's not going to go well. Um, LinkedIn, again, is gonna be your best friend. You have the opportunity to go in, look at the company, who works there? Did you meet somebody from there at one of those networking events or at a conference? Can you ping them on the side and say, hey, I just applied at this company. Um, you know, I'm supposed to interview with so-and-so on Thursday, can you put in a good word for me? Um, for me, I kind of like, I like to liken that to pen testing. If you're gonna do a social engineering engagement, do you just walk in there or do you, you know, do a little background research, try to do a little open source intelligence and learn a little bit about your target? It's the same deal. Um, you're gonna fail. Despite all your preparation, you're still gonna fail. It, it's gonna happen and, it, and it's great. <laughs> um, for me, a personal story of mine, I interviewed with a company out of Grand Rapids, Michigan and I had on my resume that I was a proficient Linux administrator. And I was just beaming when I went in there because this was a job for a Linux administrator. So I thought this was gonna be great. And I went through, answered everything correct, you know, did all the right things, sat up straight, had a smile, all that. And then their current Linux administrator asked me, what does the command chone do? Dead silence. I couldn't for the life of me think about it. You know, I did that, you know, you look up, like you're like indexing your brain, like that's gonna help you and nothing happens. Dead silence, the most awkward time in the world, probably sweat a gallon of sweat, just sitting there trying to think of it. But that's stuck with me now. What are you doing? You're changing ownership. It, duh, it's right, you know, it basically tells you. Um, but in that moment, I forgot, it happens. I didn't land that job. And I landed the next one that actually launched my career and you know, really 
kind of sent everything along. If I'd have taken that job, I'd probably still be there, and it, it wasn't all that great. Um, yeah, networking, still, more, wasn't kidding. Um, most of those opportunities are gonna be from those acquaintances and those people that you meet. It gets you past that dreaded HR screen. Um, I try to do this all the time. Anybody that I know that is looking for an information security job, I'll take their resume and I'll bring it to the hiring manager, get it around HR, because HR is gonna be looking for those silly things that nobody's gonna have that's gonna check all the boxes. You're never gonna find that unicorn. They don't exist. Um, if you don't have all those, apply for the job anyway. Because guess what? Neither does anybody else. Um, I am a hiring manager. <laughs> so I get to see this very regularly. Um, I don't need anybody with COBOL, but it still says it for some reason in the job posting. We have no mid-range systems. I don't know why it's listed there, but it is listed. Um, and if you do need help, um, or you're just not feeling confident about applying for a job, again, hit me up on that. Um, feel free to reach out, LinkedIn, Twitter. If we've talked here at the conference and you reach out to me on LinkedIn, I will network with you 100% and let's talk. We'll set up a you know, Skype session, whatever, whatever's gonna help. So if you made it through all that and you've made it to your first gig, your first real consulting gig, You've made it, right? Yeah, no. <laughs> um, I, I like to think of it as allow me to show you everything you don't know. Because in consulting, you're never going to find the systems that you're familiar with. Uh, one really good example of this was the first uh, offsite customer that I got to go see. Uh, I walked into their server closet. It wasn't a data center or anything like that. Of course, you think if you're a big time consultant now, you're going to just see all these great you know, co-locations and data centers. No, it was, it was a closet, a literal closet, and their file and print server didn't have a cover on it because they were afraid if they set it on there, it would just shut off for some, something would ground out and shut off. Um, and as I was in there doing a Symantec endpoint protection assessment, a 56K modem started screaming. Yeah. <laughs> you, you recognize it, but it's still not something you wanna hear and they were passing financials back and forth between locations over this 56K modem. Um, so that happened, and you just never know what you're gonna run into. Um, embrace it, embrace your suck. You're not gonna know, but you're gonna learn. And that, those are the things that propel you through your career, is the, those situations. Um, one of my favorite sayings is from Maynard James Keenan. We have any tool? Perfect Circle, Christopher, 10 other bands that he probably sings in. Um, one of my favorite quotes from him is he was doing an interview for Revolver Magazine and he said, you're either winning or you're learning. You only lose if you don't learn. And that's just something that I've kind of held on to um, because you're gonna have some bad times. So let's have story time. Uh, one of my worst times was the the first real big engagement that I was ever on. Uh, it was for a global company, and I was doing a Symantec endpoint protection health check for them. They were on three continents, and I remember very specifically that they had 12 group update providers. Does anybody here know Symantec endpoint protection? Okay, I didn't know what a group update provider was. I wasn't even certified in SEP and I was doing this health check for them. So after a week of scratching my head, trying to figure out what best practices were and not really being able to do my job uh, very well, the salesperson said that even his 10 year old son could handle this so it wouldn't be a big deal. Uh, it came time to give my final report. It was the most awkward phone call in my entire life. <laughs> So I'm trying to explain you know, what the best practices are and they, their uh, expert is coming back and asking me questions about why that would be the best practice for them. Dead silence. I didn't have the answers. I didn't know why I was telling them what I, could what I, what I was telling them. Uh, I really wasn't in any position to be doing that. 
And there was just a lot of dead air, which is not a good thing to have <laughs> on a phone call. So that one experience though of not knowing was great because it forced me to get into the product and really propel myself because I never wanted to fail like that again. And if you get into consulting, you're going to have that moment. There's no way around it, okay? A any of my you know, current consultants, you guys have those? Yeah? It's a bad time, but it's gonna pro propel you to learn more. So don't sweat it, brush it off your shoulder. Um, I was ready to throw in the towel and go back to welding. It was such a bad time. And fortunately, my wife said, uh, how much do you know? How quickly did you make this transition? You're going to have these times. Some of the best advice I ever had. So some of the lessons that I learned during that time was uh, ambition is great, but you have to know when to ask for help. That's not a bad thing. Uh, in my case, I should have gone back to the salesperson and said, hey, look, you know, I understand your 10-year-old could do this. Your 10-year-old probably knows more than me. Mine does. Um, he's a great, great locksmith. Um, that's what I should have done. Was I should have went back to him and said, this isn't working out. Let's fix this before we crash this engagement. Because instead of going headlong into it, we could have fixed it. We could have got uh, you know, a more experienced consultant in, somebody who was uh, already certified in the product to sit with me and mentor me and walk through it together and make this a good experience for the customer and a good learning experience for me as well. And then everybody does better. Uh, and ambition is kind of a, a double-edged sword. Uh, I like to say that it's one of those things that I can't teach. You know, I can teach a lot of things, but I can't teach ambition. People either have it or they don't, and they have to find it. I can teach skills. You know, you want to learn how to uh, you know, set up rules on a firewall? No problem. Let's sit down. We'll crash course through it. I'm sure I've got an, you know, some garbage ASA sitting in a closet somewhere I can throw you in. You know, we'll figure it out. Um, but ambition, that's, that's something that's going to come from inside. It's also very quickly, uh, it, very easy to quickly overwhelm yourself with ambition. Um, I have one of these guys right now, one of my junior guys. He will say yes to everything. He wants to be on every project. He wants to learn everything. And sometimes we just have to pump the brakes on him a little bit because otherwise he'll take everything on and he'll never accomplish anything. It happens. So we talk about ambition being our double-edged sword, double-edged sword of a thousand truths. If anybody gets that, we can be friends. So what's next in your career? You've made it to that first engagement. You survived, you've embraced your suck, what next? Don't settle. Um, it's very easy to kind of get into cruise control and just coast along in that job because it gets comfortable. My first consulting engagement, I really couldn't do any wrong because they were always throwing me the same types of engagements over and over again. And you could have almost just changed the name of the company on the front page, print it back out, send it out here. These are the things you need to fix because there were the same vulnerabilities over and over again, or it was the same product over and over again. We'd keep seeing it. Um, but when I say don't settle, be appreciative for the opportunity that you've had there. Um, in my case, I knew next to nothing starting that first engagement at that first company. Uh, I very much knew more about welding than I did IT security. Um, be respectful with everybody that you work with. I can't stress that enough. You never know what somebody else is working on, what they know, what they've experienced, and the things that you can learn from them. Uh, I also like to say be humble because one of those opportunities that's gonna crush you is right around the corner and they're gonna happen and you just have to embrace them and learn from them. But do not settle. There's always gonna be another opportunity out there. It's gonna be better and it's gonna be a way for you to move. Um, hey, networking, once more, it's still very much a thing here. Um, because as you get out on the road and you start going to other companies, you're gonna to start to meet more people. They're gonna know your face because you ultimately are the face of the company that you work for when you go there. 
Uh, some of the best advice I was ever given was by a guy by the name of Wolfgang Gorlick, a good friend of mine, and he really was the one who got me started. My first three interviews, he lined them up. He knew nothing about my experience. Not a thing. I knew nothing about Windows servers. He got me an interview for a Windows server admin position. Yeah, awkward, right? <laughs> um, but he believed in my ambition enough that he was willing to do that. That stuff's going to happen. But you are your own brand. You're going to leave that company at some point. The company's going to fold. Something's going to happen. But that customer is going to remember your face with the company. Um, my customers didn't know CBI. They knew Justin. And they knew if they had a problem, they could call Justin. They weren't going to call CBI because Justin knew their environment. Justin knew them, and Justin knew the situations that they were in. Um, so just remember that, that you're the face. And some of the things that are going to come from that are job offers. That's awkward. <laughs> Um, I would often find myself on residencies for six months or more. Um, probably the biggest one was uh, about a year and a half. And when the engagement finally ended, they made me a job offer uh, for more money because they just wanted to keep me on uh, to run their cybersecurity program. It's kind of a curse and a blessing. One, it gives you a backup plan. Um, if anybody is familiar with One World Labs and the situation surrounding that, um, it was a bad time. There was some unfortunate things that happened as part of a fallout from a talk. And all of a sudden, there were a lot of consultants who needed to find other places to work. Uh, when you get out on the road, you get to find some of those opportunities and you make those connections just in case. Um, you also have opportunities for raises, but I want to stress a lot of caution with these. Um, most of those job offers that I was given were also for more money than I was making consulting. Because at the end of the day, they were paying the consulting house a hell of a lot more money than <laughs> the consulting house was paying me. So it made sense for them to do it. Um, but I really have to caution that. Um, one, if you find yourself in a lot of engagements, don't go back to your company every month when a new customer gives you a job offer because then it looks like you just want to jump ship. Um, but going to them with the occasional one, and framing it correctly, uh, I would often invite my manager out for dinner, and you know we'd meet up, and I just kind of in jest say, "Yeah, can you believe they wanted to offer me ten thousand more than what CBI is paying me right now to stay there?" And about a week later, he'd be like, "Hey, you're not going to believe this. We found some more money for you." <laughs> like, yeah, we just went out and there's a coffee can in the backyard. We dug it up, and you know we found some money in there. Huh, strange. Strange how that happens. Um, but be very mindful of any non-compete that you may have signed. Yeah, because those come back to bite you because we all read the, you know, we read EULAs and we read contracts and all that stuff before we sign them, right? Everybody? Yeah? No. <laughs> um, it, in my case, I know I signed one when I started at that first company because I was so excited. Yeah, you weren't paying any attention to that stuff. Um, and as such, it ended up being uh, a big process to actually get out there, out of there and move to the company that I work for now, uh, which by the vibration, I'm guessing a few people have figured out. You can learn something from everyone. Beware the janitor. <laughs> um, one of my first jobs outside of high school was working as a custodian. We'll call them janitor, so on and so forth. Um, they know everything. They know everyone. They see everything. Um, for me, myself, I was an 18-year-old working for my now father-in-law. Hey, how'd that work out? Um, and I would be in several companies at night seeing all the papers on the desks, seeing everything that was being thrown away, learning everything about every aspect of that company. And you start to pick up little things that, believe it or not, you can use them later. Um, one of the things that I picked up was toilet bowl cleaner takes care of the calcium stains on stainless steel drinking fountains. Bet you didn't know that. But it also got me in in a pen test. 
because I went in with the caddy and I was able to prove to the security guard right there in the lobby that I knew what I was doing and I had to get on the second and third floor. And if he wanted, he could come with me. It's gonna take two or three minutes. Bam, bam, I'm in and out, no problem. I was bam, bam, in and out, no problem, but I got what I needed to get and I got access to the floor. So something silly like that, you can learn something from everyone. Don't discredit them. I, I, I can't stress that enough. Um, also, one more reason to beware the janitor, uh, never screw with the person who cleans your coffee cup and scrubs the toilets, <laughs> okay? Life lesson. So fast forward a couple years, you've been on the road, it wears on you. Um, have realistic expectations for what your life is going to look like when you're on the road. 307 nights, you know how much I was home? The joke was I have a great home, that's what I'm told. Um, I had to get my brother to basically move into my house to take care of my dog because of some situations we'll talk about in a minute. Um, are you an introvert? God, how many of us are introverts in this field, right? You can't bring your blanket for it with you on site as much as I wanted to. <laughs> if you're an extrovert, it's great. You get to meet tons of people. You get to talk to all the people, it's great. Introvert, ugh, it's hell. Um, have an honest conversation with your partner. Are you married? Are you getting married? You might not see them a whole lot. Uh, how about kids? Do you have kids? Do you want kids? I had four. Yeah, that's a bad time. Uh, pets, you know, got a dog, a cat, some number of fish, it fluctuates. You know, they're like rabbits. Um, all that stuff has to be taken into account. You have to care for those things. I was home a day and a half a week for three years. And I had a brand new daughter, three months old, when I went on the road. That's gonna mess with you. So that's all stuff that you really have to take into account before you decide to make that move. Are you ready for it? Um, my youngest brother, single guy, 21 years old, I couldn't kick him in the ass hard enough to get him into consulting. I was like, you're gonna go see the world on somebody else's dime. You're gonna get to travel, you're gonna rack up sky miles, hotel points, everything, whatever you want. I bought my uh, PS4 off hotel points, you know? Why not? Um, but have that conversation because you're gonna run into some times uh, where it gets difficult. Um, to be very candid and very real with you guys, one of the hardest conversations I ever had was that same year, 2015, when I had those 307 nights. Um, I arrived home and I could tell that something was bothering my wife, my kids were upset. You could see a change in them over time. And she pulled me inside and she just said, you know, to be honest, I'm, just exp I'm waiting for the day when you just don't come home because there's not a point. And I was expecting her to say, you know, just don't, because I was at the hotel all the time. I was never home. That can happen. It can happen, and it does happen to a lot of people. It's a bad time. Um, since then, I got off the road, you know, just we'll fast forward a little bit here. Everything's cool now, everything's good, kids are happy, daughter spends all my money, it's great, yeah, <laughs> you know. Um, but as far as the self-care is concerned, this is probably one of the most important parts of going on the road and being a consultant. Um, there are a lot of consultants who work from home and you know that stuff's not too bad. You just kind of shut yourself away, you know, do your thing. Um, but if you're gonna be a road warrior and you're gonna be on the road a lot of times, um, I would always hear that it's great. You get to see all these, you get to stay in all these great hotels you know, you get to travel to all these great places and see all these huge cities and uh, eat at all these restaurants. And it sounds great, but in reality, you're at the customer site and then you go back to your hotel room and you work from your hotel room for another five, six hours. You wander down to the hotel bar because you don't really want to go out. You're tired, you don't really want to do that. You've already eaten at every restaurant around. You don't have time to go see the city. Um, so this is what your hotel room starts to feel like. 
it looks great, but ultimately it kind of feels like a prison cell over time. Um, some of the recommendations that I can make that I learned really in the last year that I was on the road, uh, join a gym. It's not for everyone. It ended up being my thing. Um, you know, I had more hair last time I was here. I also had about 50 more pounds. But um, it gives you an opportunity to get out of that prison cell hotel room, burn off some stress. Um, if you look for something with nationwide facilities, I myself, I like to go to SNAP because I can find one in pretty much every city that I end up having to travel to. Um, but it gives you an opportunity to get out and talk to people and burn off some stress. Uh, take online or on-premises classes. The on-prem stuff can be kind of difficult because you may not necessarily know what your schedule is going to be. I did a lot of residencies, so I knew where I was going to be for about six months at a time. Um, it was kind of a staff augmentation type thing where you'd come in and you'd launch something, get it going, and kind of run it for a little bit. Um, the on-prem stuff is nice because you actually go into the class and, again, you meet some people, you interface with people. Um, but the online stuff, you kind of have some of that as well. Look for social or professional networking events, like Network After Work. Um, those are great because, again, you get to meet more people. You might even meet some people in the area where you're working, and now you've got a reason to go out you know, and leave the hotel and get dinner. Um, you might even make some friends and make some more connections uh, with other companies. And then your project manager is going to be like, yeah, you should try to sell them on some services because that's what they do. Um, last but not least, take your PTO. <laughs> Does anybody in here feel like they can't take PTO? Guys in the back, yeah. I get that a lot. Um, because if I take PTO... Nobody's doing my work for me. It's just going to be there when I get done, or whenever I get back from vacation. It's going to be there waiting for me. Um, and a lot of people feel like they lose their momentum if they don't take their PTO, or like guilted almost into not taking it. Um, you have it for a reason. Get away from the job site. Uh, I like to disconnect for five days in August. I go out to northern Michigan. I have a place that I like to go to out there. No phone, no laptop, no kids, just me and my dog. And then I've got a backpack with a hammock and a few other supplies, and that's it. There, it is a no-tech week, and it's just a time to kind of recharge my own batteries. I would highly recommend that if that's your thing. If it's not your thing, don't go out in the woods. It's not, <laughs> it's not gonna work out, okay? There's a big difference between uh, high brush cranberries and the cranberries you get at the grocery store. Part of that is you know, the amount of time you're going to spend with a bad stomach. Um, more life lessons. Um, and maybe don't completely disconnect because, let's face it, uh, if you have kids, Pokemon Go is life. And those eggs aren't going to hatch themselves. Um, I have a little bracelet that they make me take everywhere with me so when I travel I can catch them Pokemon from all over the place. Um, so that, that does happen. Um, any questions at this point? Anybody might have. No. I was expecting a bit more. Um, all right. So what do you do if you actually do want to make the jump to another company? Um, one of my friends right now is going through a situation where he did have that non-compete clause and there is legal action uh, that was being taken against him. There are several services that you can buy as a consultant to have legal on demand if needed. So if that comes in, it costs about $5 a month to $17 a month is what I've seen for the range, but it does protect you. Um, and I don't want to turn this into an advertisement for them, but if you are working in the field, and you do occasionally entertain some of these offers, I would strongly recommend it. We can talk about it afterwards if you'd like to. Um, I don't want to totally give them a plug. They're not going to pay me, so I'm not going to waste the time on that. Um, but that's kind of where I want to leave it uh, for today. If you have any questions after the fact and want to come and talk to me about it, 
Um, I'm here for the next couple of days. We can go, you know, grab a drink or whatever and talk. Uh, otherwise, I'll probably be in some of these other talks. Thank you very much.